Yeah. Um, when we hear things like flesh eating bacteria, for normal people, it's pretty scary. This is Dr. Peter Hortez, Hortez, and you are with Baylor College of Medicine, and this is your specialty. That's right, that's right. I, I run a tropical medicine school, uh -huh. uh, one of the only one of its kind, and we set it up in Houston because the Gulf Coast region is particularly susceptible to tropical infections. So a lot of us walk through some of that flood water, right, right. and a lot of us got of it in our, in our homes. Mm -hmm. How are we getting the flesh-eating bacteria? How did that happen for that woman in the Kingwood area? Well, unfortunately, those floodwaters are a toxic soup. They have uh, lots of potential chemical toxins, but also bacteria as well, and different types of bacteria, including a, uni a unique type of bacteria that we have here on the Gulf Coast called Vibrio, Vibrio vulnificus. And, uh, and what happens is if you have a cut or an open wound on your skin, that, those bacteria can enter and they have the ability to invade through the tissues. They produce enzymes that actually destroy the Ooh. tissues and then can get access to the bloodstream. Fortunately, it's our, overall it's a rare infection, but um, we've seen this about, we see about a dozen cases on the Gulf Coast every year and then there's an uptick during the time of floods and hurricanes. So for instance, more than a dozen years ago, after Katrina, mm -hmm. we saw several dozen cases and about six deaths from this flesh-eating mm -hmm. flesh bacteria. Now, this particular woman, they haven't reported yet, at least publicly, what the bacteria is, but there are several different types that can do it, including ones that are unique to the Gulf Coast. Um, I know there are a lot of other things that we're going to talk about um, in this topic, but um, another thing that I've um, experienced with the number of people I've talked to since the storm, rashes and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, anything that we can do when, when you look at something and you naturally think the worst, right? right, right. Um, is that something that's quite common as well? Yeah, certainly you're exposed to all sorts of things in the water. If the mm -hmm. things to look out for if you have a, if certainly if you've gotten a cut or a wound that's gotten infected and you see any redness or swelling or if you have a fever or if you have flu-like symptoms afterwards, you don't want to wait on this one. This one uh, can progress very rapidly and you want to seek medical attention. Right well, and away. so how do you know though? I mean, you don't want to sort of panic instantly, but I mean, how do you know that it's something that you really need to get checked out versus so, something that's just going to go away? So the three things, if you have a cut that you know has been exposed to uh, floodwaters, mm -hmm. uh, swelling, redness, and pain, those are, those are kind of the three signs. And certainly if you have any kind of fever as well, but swelling, redness, and pain I'll tell you what, are the we, three things to look for. Okay, makes sense. Um, do we have some questions? I think some people are wanting to, to we, get you to you to get some questions. We sure. do have yes, a question. Sir. Audrey would like to know, can this bacteria survive out of water? Uh, generally not. It generally, once it's on a dry surface, it would not last for, for a very long time. Oh, okay, another question. one is, if somebody has been potentially at risk, is there any preventive, preventative measures that they should take or a shot they need, or what do you recommend? Well, certainly uh, another bacteria that we worry about is the, the bacteria that causes tetanus. Sure. Uh, and yeah. so you want to make certain that you, you keep up to date with your tetanus vaccinations. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not recommending you specifically get vaccinated if you've been exposed to floodwaters, only if you haven't had a tetanus vaccine over the past 10 years if you're an adult. So regardless of whether or not you've been exposed to floodwaters, make sure you're up to date with your tetanus vaccines, uh, also your hepatitis vaccines. And if you have a child, you want to consult with your pediatrician to make sure that your child's up to date with all the shots, sure. all the his or shots. Okay, yeah. we have another question. Nicole would like to know, is this bacteria contagious? Uh, generally not. It's generally from exposure from the floodwaters. Okay, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. There are actually some other things that you want to talk about as well that kind of Harvey has brought in. Well, I think the other uh, gift that Harvey brings us is with floodwaters are mosquitoes and mosquito-borne infections. Mm. Uh, I say gift with a sort of a sarcastic way. Right. Um, uh, one of the things that we've learned after floods is you can get a big uptick in West Nile virus infection. So we have West Nile uh, this time of year anyway in Texas, yeah. but with the floodwaters, that provides new breeding sites for mosquitoes. So we would expect to see an increase uh, in West Nile. So that's something we're looking out for as well. So again, if you have fever and a rash, you potentially could have West Nile. The problem that we get into with West Nile virus is if you're an older individual, say over the age of 55 or 60, mm -hmm. there's a higher likelihood that virus can uh, invade the brain or the central nervous system to cause encephalitis. 
So uh, we worry, they call it neuroinvasive yeah. uh, West Nile virus infection. What's interestingly, a dozen years ago, back with Katrina, what we found is there was a problem with West Nile right after the floods, but also a full year after that. So we'll also have to look at next mosquito season. So right now the mosquitoes are going to start to go down very slowly as we go uh -huh. into uh, October and November, uh, and we'll think we're out of the woods. But the following but mosquito season, we could also see an uptick from West Nile for reasons that oh. we don't, don't entirely understand. Oh, that's awful. Yeah. Oh, geez, so, we have some more questions. So, so the co point is the yeah. consequences of, the health consequences of Harvey are going to be with us for at least a year. And, uh. and, and it's hard to even predict, because remember, this is an event of unprecedented size and scope. Yeah. So uh, you know, com trying to compare with other hurricanes, this thing is the mother of all hurricanes. We're talking about 30 trillion gallons of water over a pretty large area, mm -hmm. extending from Corpus Christi all the way up into Beaumont, into Louisiana. Yeah, all right, I think we have a couple more questions. Yeah, Isaiah has two questions. He wants to know, what would happen if an oil spill hit on land, and is it treatable? I don't know if he worked in the oil area. Well, may, perhaps what he's getting at is, uh, you know, the Gulf Coast also has a very high density of oil and gas refineries. Mm -hmm. And, and ver various chemicals are used in the processing of oil, chemicals such as benzene or toluene. So uh, as the floodwaters uh, encroach on those refineries, uh, there's been chemical spills and leakages of things like benzene and toluene. So something else we're going to have to look for over a much longer term is some of those chemicals are carcinogenic, uh, can cause cancer. So we're going to have to see if this, this event is going to have any long-term effects on cancer rates. And is it treatable? If he was exposed to that on land? Well, the problem is it's hard to know what it is. One okay. of the things that we're doing at uh, Baylor College of Medicine is uh, uh, there's a, we have an environmental health group uh, that's collaborating with another university in Oregon that actually has a bracelet with that looks a little bit like this one, with, yeah, which, uh, like which, my is, red bracelet which is here. very spongy-like, and it absorbs the chemicals, and they're going to actually uh, count the number of chemicals that people are actually exposed oh. to. So we're going to learn a lot from this event. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's going to be with us for a while. Okay. Um, anything before we say goodbye? Any more sort of um, advice or just information you want to pass along post Harvey? Uh, I think you know th this is a stressful time, and uh, and it's good to acknowledge that it's a stressful time because mm -hmm. we haven't really gone into the mental health effects. But you know we're going to we're going to see PTSD. We're going to post traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. We're going to see. Don't be surprised if you know you're feeling depressed or or having uh, uh, feelings of anxiety or worry. This is a normal reaction, but if it starts to impair your day-to-day -day activities, you want to get help from a mental health professional, psychiatrist, yeah. or a mental health counselor. Uh, Dr. Hotez from Baylor College of Medicine, thank you so much for joining us, and thanks to all of you. Thanks so much for having me.